let me welcome everybody who is participating participating in this webinar and also welcome Mr. Hank Harris who, who has graciously given his time to talk to us about hydrogen transition and the transportation uh, sector of the economy. Uh, but let me first say a few things about CEPS. CEPS is an acronym for Carbon Free Hydrogen Production and Storage, and it is a project that started at the University of Oklahoma under the support of the Vice President for Research and Partnerships. It's one of the big idea challenge uh, projects that were supported by the by the VPRP's office. And the challenge that this group of people, the, the CEPS people, uh, is trying to address is decarbonization and transition from a fossil fuel based economy and energy uh, use to a hydrogen based economy and energy use and we try to do that by looking at technical uh, difficulties in doing that production of hydrogen and also looking at the economic and social um, uh, effects that a transition like that is going to have to states like Oklahoma and communities like communities around Norman. So with this brief introduction about CEPs, I'm going to turn it over to Professor Zev Trachtenberg, who is in the Department of Philosophy and also Director of Environmental Studies at the University of Oklahoma, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, uh, Dimitrios. Uh, well, we are just thrilled to have Hank Harris uh, with us today. He's an energy consultant with Energy and Infrastructure Advisors uh, Corporation, which is based in La Jolla uh, in California. Uh, Hank has over 35 years of energy trading and marketing experience. Uh, he's worked primarily for the trading and marketing subsidiary of Royal Dutch Shell in North America and for several units within the Sempra Corporation umbrella. Uh, Hank holds an MBA from Texas A&M uh, at Corpus Christi and a BS in business administration from San Diego State. Presently, Hank is an energy consultant with Energy and Infrastructure Advisors Corporation, uh, which goes by EIA uh, in Loya. EIA assists clients in developing solutions to enter or expand current marketing or trading opportunities. EIA is interested in developing energy transition and decarbonization of the energy industry and works with clients to develop programs to meet environmental, societal, and governmental or ESG um, goals. Um, and before I turn it over to Hank, who will uh, show us some slides, let me just point out to um, the people in attendance, um, I guess somebody has already uh, seen this, uh, you can post questions in the, in the um, Q and A um, as, uh, as we go. Uh, and then uh, when Hank is done, I'll start collecting uh, questions and, and see if I can, if there are any that uh, go together, I'll put them together and then we'll be able to have discussion. Um, I got a uh, request for subtitles and I will see what I can do uh, about that. I'm afraid I can't guarantee that. We'll see if we can uh, make that happen. Um, so without further ado, let me turn things over to our guest, Hank Harris. Seth, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate uh, Chep's inviting me to speak today, and I'm happy to spend some time with all of those of you who are taking some time out of your day to uh, learn a bit more about hydrogen. Uh, a lot of people have some very high hopes that hydrogen can clean up our planet. The images of water dripping out of the tailpipe of a car are pretty emotive. But you know, the closer we get to trying to use hydrogen as a primary fuel source, the more we find out we don't know about it or that it uncovers uh, new opportunities or problems. That's why the work of groups like CHEPS is so critical in helping to understand how to move forward with the hydrogen across many facets of our modern society and economy. My next slide is about me, but Zev did a great job, so I'm not going to repeat it. The only thing Do you want to go ahead and share your, uh, share your presentation again, Hank, so we can see? Oh, am I not sharing? Okay, hold on. I'm sorry. Thank you. Let me escape. Uh, Zoom. Where are we here? Get Zoom. Okay. Share screen. There we go. All right. You see it? Should be yes. me. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Boom. Hi. <laughs> Looks so, just like um, Thanks. Uh, so yeah, anyhow, uh, like I said, uh, Dr. Trackenberg uh, pretty much covered most of these bullets, so I won't go over them again. 
the only one I'll mention is just, you know, I'm not an engineer or a chemist. I just look at the world through the lens of economic and market strength and propositions to see if it can support itself and provide all the necessary results, or can it be levered for progress in another overall area? And I don't think this is how I got the job, but my mom is a class of 52 graduate from OU. Okay, here's something to remember. $5 trillion, don't forget that number. It's the estimated cost to upgrade the US power grid to be 100% renewable. Don't have to pay it all at once, but you know, over time, that's what they're looking at. So where are uh, greenhouse gases produced in the economy? And this is sort of a pie chart that gives you a flavor for this pie um, globally. Um, and ones we're gonna talk about today really are transportation. And we're gonna get into electricity a little bit just because of the connectivity that electric production now has with battery electric vehicles. Also, the uh, thought is that the um, incredible amounts of carbon-free energy will be delivered um, electrically. Now, greenhouse gases, uh, global warming, it's a global problem to solve. Electric vehicles in California will not offset all the coal plants in China. Uh, China and India both have increasing middle classes, but China more so than India. China has about 735 million people that fall into that category, and India only has about 100 million. Well, between the two of them, that's a gigantic country, but... Um, but like most middle-class uh, individuals, they want middle-class things. They want air conditioning, cars, better food and clothing, all of which put more strain on global emissions. The good thing about developing countries is that they are entering the technology curve as it stands now. So cars can be electrified. And as we'll see later, China is the fastest growing EV market on the planet. Uh, and electrification can be renewable or zero carbon to run those air conditioners. Increasing methane from agricultural demands can be managed now via di digesters and renewable natural gas. Coal remains at the heart of China's flourishing economy. In 2019, 58% of the country's total energy consumption came from coal, which helps explain why China accounts for 28% of all global CO2 emissions. China continues to add, not remove, coal plants. China prefers coal plants because the uh, over gas because they are cheaper and quicker to build. China is also a major coal producer. With an ever-increasing demand for power, coal works for the Chinese. The Chinese add tens of gigawatts per year of coal generation. Now, to put this in perspective, a gigawatt can provide enough energy to supply 725,000 homes. That's a lot of homes. Uh, it would take 3.125 million 320 watt solar panels and almost 1500 acres to put them on or 364 2.75 megawatt utility scale wind turbines to produce that much energy. So here's a, a nice little chart with sub detail on specific areas that cause greenhouse gas emissions. So you can just kind of dial around it and pick one. Um, I'll point out, and I think probably most people are aware of it, that greenhouse gas emissions are CO2 and methane. And so the methane kind of falls into this agricultural and waste area. So transportation and electric production are the two largest areas in both the US and globally to tackle. With battery electric vehicles, they're linked together. Electricity is seen as the key to unlocking the mass distribution of zero carbon energy. President Biden has set a target for carbon free power sector by 2035. This target does include, however, keeping existing nuclear power plants in the mix of generating assets. Capacity factors for utility level generation plants are much higher than renewable resources. Uh, a capacity factor is essentially how much power a plant can produce versus what it actually produces over an annual period. 
For instance, wind comes in at like 25 to 40%, whereas nuclear is 93. And most of your gas fired turbines are in the 90, low 90s or high 80s. The good news is electric generation is already reducing its CO2 footprint in the US and the EU, if not China, um, via increased renewable generation and coal to gas fuel switching. General Electric is presently deploying a 3070 mix turbine. So 30% hydrogen, 70% uh, natural gas. Uh, and has is also let's see here they're also working towards a 50 50 which is probably possible today and 100 percent hydrogen turbine is still being studied but they plan on deploying one in 2045. the united states has reduced its coal-fired power plants from a high of 1522 in 2005 down to now 240 which has had a 12% reduction in CO2 from 2005 levels in the energy sector. Um, GE has several demonstration projects of these hydrogen facilities uh, in the USA, Australia, and China. Given the huge quantities of fuel needed in utility scale uh, gas fired power plants, the timing may not be right presently for hydrogen to play a major role in power generation given the current costs for hydrogen. While hydrogen fuel costs are trending lower, the expectations are that they will remain at least two to 10 times more expensive than natural gas through the end of the decade. Further development of residential fuel cell technology may move along the technology curve that will eliminate the need for utility scale generation and transmission distribution. So this is what the mix of electricity looks like between 1950 and 2020. Uh, it's made up of, you can, you can read this legend too, but you know, petroleum, renewables, nuclear, natural gas, and uh, coal. In the US and EU, coal is being displaced by renewables and natural gas. Access to cheap, abundant natural gas um, combined with combined with uh, advances in efficient plant designs, essentially combined cycle, was the real demise of coal. Coal was basically just outperformed in the market by combined cycle gas generation. Now, renewable generation is advantaged via government subsidies, tax credits, and mandates. However, production costs continue to decline, as are the subsidies. A minute ago, we talked about capacity factors, and renewables do have a lower capacity factor than the rest of the stack. A wind turbine may be rated at three megawatts, but if the wind stops blowing, it will sit idle. That's why the average capacity factor for wind turbines falls to 25 to 40%. Solar ranges between 10 and 25%. When the sun doesn't shine, the solar will sit idle, cloudy day or night. Um, any other plants will run 24, 7, 365, and thus have much higher capacity factors as we talked about nuclear at 93 and some of the uh, gas fired in the 90s or high 80s. There need to be a mix of resources of production to get to zero CO2 for utility scale. Nuclear and hydro resources can help, but other than nuclear, only the, the only utility scale power plant in the US excuse me, the only utility, nuclear is the only utility scale power plant in the US that is 100% carbon free and can support the modern economy. Renewables are great until the wind doesn't blow or the clouds pass by, but this reduces their capacity factor. And the modern grid needs some sort of large scale plant to support the grid constantly, every minute of every day of every night. Initially, batteries were thought to be able to maybe play a role in the, uh, support of the grid, but are, have turned out to be expensive and the current designs won't hold the amount of power required to support the grid through all the off-peak hours. So where can hydrogen fit into utility scale generation? 
it begs the question, if you need utility schedule generation to support our modern society, can hydrogen be part of that? Japan says hi or yes. Los Angeles says yes. So Japan is all in on a hydrogen economy and is targeting 80% of its energy sources to be hydrogen based. Los Angeles Department of Water and Power is presently fuel switching a huge uh, coal plant, 100% coal, to a mix of hydrogen and natural gas, the 3070, and we're going to dig into that a little bit more here. Hydrogen is a very clean fuel source when it's used as in a fuel cell, but when you burn hydrogen, it releases nitrous oxides, which are hazardous to humans. Well, now, nitrous oxides can be removed from the stack using specific catalytic performing technology, scrubbers, uh, but this adds cost to the process and operations. Hydrogen can be used in distributed generation to generate electricity via fuel cells. This is taking root in Japan and has been offered as a commercial product in the US through Bloom Energy and the EU since 2009. Fuel cells generate heat, which can be recovered and used to heat pools or hot water for use in the home. All right, let's move over to the Intermountain Power Project. So this is really closing a coal-fired plant, but rather than throw away the assets and people, IPP is changing their business model to a green renewable hub and save, and using the existing benefits um, to create this new business model. Um, Intermountain Power Project is a 1,900 megawatt, that's very big, uh, coal plant in Utah with transmission lines back to the LA Basin. The goal is to be the first 100% powered hydrogen plant in the world. Generating green hydrogen with excess renewable energy on site and storing it in salt caverns below the plant. Presently, they are repowering to the 3070 GE turbine technology with the goal to be ready to go to the GE 100% hydrogen technology in 2045. So the things that are being retained and leveraged are the proximity to regional renewables, you know, the wind, the solar, the th geothermal, um, and existing transmission system, water rights, which in the West are incredibly valuable, maybe more than the plant, uh, over 4,000 acres of land, and a unique underground salt formation, which is ideal for storing hydrogen. Uh, they also have a highly skilled workforce at Intermountain Power Project. This is a $1.9 billion project from start to finish. The design works really because of number five. So you, they've got this unique salt formation where they can store it. And the availability of excess renewable generation. This won't be the case in most locations. However, the 3070 fuel mix can work at all locations with plant modifications. By looking at the plant through a SWOT, sort of a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats approach, many jobs were saved and local communities didn't suffer. That's something that I think in the transition to a hydrogen economy or a low um, carbon economy, we do need to consider. Perfectly good equipment and intangible rights were preserved. So we've been talking a bit about colors of hydrogen. And so what color would you like? The color really just refers to the hydrogen process, manufacturing process and the source of the input. So we'll walk through a few of these. So gray, that is steam methane reforming. It is what is currently being used. It's very energy intensive and generates a lot of CO2 back into the atmosphere. Um, it tends to use natural gas or coal as its sources. Blue is exactly the same as gray, but they, um, put in carbon capture and storage and carbon capture and, or usage um, and to eliminate the carbon. So it is considered carbon free because you have not released the carbon into the atmosphere. Green is the holy grail. It's generated using renewable energy sources and performed by processing water through an electrolyzer to separate the hydrogen. Zero CO2 from source to sink. Pink and yellow, anyone? Hmm, they're the same as green, except for the fuel. Pink is the electrolyzer being powered by nuclear, and yellow is the electrolyzer being powered with solar-only resources. 
Now, blue is where Japan is targeting to start their hydrogen economy because it's the least cost and with CCS and CCU is considered carbon free. The carbon remains sequestered in the producing country, not in Japan, although it would still be blue even if the carbon had been sequestered in Japan. But I think it is interesting that Japan pushes off any future sequestration problems on the producer, which have those, they buy a lot of their uh, blue hydrogen from Qatar and Australia. Uh, we did not mention, but should have, uh, brown and black hydrogen. Same as gray, but they use either lignite, which is a really dirty high sulfur coal, or just regular coal, like black coal from central Appalachia. Okay, transportation. That's what you're all waiting for, right? So transportation is a huge contributor to global greenhouse gases. There are over one and a half billion individual sources of carbon emitters driving around the planet right now. So which way? Battery electric or fuel cell electric? I think the quote from uh, Alice in Wonderland is appropriate. So you, Alice is, comes to a fork in the road, you know, which way should she go? The uh, Cheshire cat says, hey, it doesn't really matter. Where do you want to go? <laughs> it doesn't matter. It depends on where you want to go. Looking at transportation specifically. So these are the global CO2 emissions and transportation by type of transportation uh, in, as of 2000. Many environmentalists want greenhouse gases from transportation all to go to zero right now and focus a lot on energy from aviation and shipping. Now, I would argue, quite frankly, since we only have three years left to live, according to the UN, that we probably should go from more uh, activity in the medium and heavy duty trucks and passenger cars, you get more bang for your buck, more immediate results. So we can dive into that a bit. So here are the 1.5 billion cars and trucks as they are sprinkled around the planet. You can see the bulk of them, almost a third, are in Asia. Then you have 400,000 each in the European Union and North America. South America, you get 100,000, excuse me, 100 million. And then uh, Middle East, North Africa, another 100. And the thing I like about this uh, chart is, although it is focused on urban transport, so it doesn't give us much info on heavy duty trucks, which probably pop in and out of urban areas is you know construction, delivery, waste collection. Um, it does give you a nice um, full cycle view. Um, so you can see that uh, one of the areas where people used to say, "Oh well, battery vehicles aren't that great because you know they have they're really dirty to make them. You got all the mining, the batteries, the chemicals, the separation processes, and then when they're done, you have to just when are you gonna stack these things all up in a landfill somewhere? So this present is a life of the product presentation where that's taken into account for the car electric, which has only 99 grams per kilometer mile versus the gasoline car at the very bottom, which has 210 grams per carbon of carbon per kilometer. Either way, the gasoline car is still dirty because it's got this constant uh, stream of carbon coming out of its tailpipe instead of water dripping on the street. Now, the good news is that in Asia, more specifically China, uh, automobiles entering the market now are cleaner. The technology curve has shifted and they're buying cleaner automobiles. So battery electric vehicles or fuel cell vehicles, does it matter? Probably not, because both ach technologies achieve zero tail carbon tailpipe emissions. One delivers it via lithium ion battery, the other via hydrogen gas. Battery electric vehicles have led in all markets. Um, BEVs are also cheaper than fuel cell vehicles. Uh, fuel cells are, um, 
where battery uh, vehicles are top sellers in China and Europe, two huge markets for automobiles. And battery electric vehicle range is improving. Uh, many of them now have 400 mile ranges, which is one of the areas that a lot of customers were really concerned about. You know, you're driving down the road and all of a sudden, ah, I'm on empty. What now? Um, globally, and in the US, batteries are outselling hydrogen vehicles by a huge factor. Worldwide total to date sales are 31,000 hydrogen vehicles to 7 million battery electric vehicles. The fuel cell vehicles suffer from being expensive to buy and hard to fuel due to the lack of fueling station infrastructure. The fuel is generally more expensive than electricity and gas, unless you live in California in this case. That's not true because electricity is very expensive. Out here. We're paying 40 cents a kilowatt hour. Studies by a Norwegian renewable energy consultancy, ENVGL, show that the decision to buy an electric or basically non-internal combustion engine car comes down to four key criteria. Range, performance, convenience of recharging or refueling, and price. Now you can't refuel, unfortunately, a fuel cell electric vehicle at home, but you can a battery electric. Most people have time over the night to fully charge a battery electric vehicle, so don't find the refueling times to be so outlandish. Here's a little chart that just does a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, I've stolen that from Euronews, you can see that at the bottom, of uh, petrol, electric, and hydrogen cars. So what does hydrogen need to do to win the market share race? Well, for starters, they need to sell more units to spread the fixed costs of manufacturing in order to reduce the unit price. Hmm. However, to sell more cars, you need more hydrogen fueling stations. <laughs> that just seems to be the chicken and the egg there. Um, and we need to reduce the fuel cost of hydrogen. Uh, initial tax credits could close the spread for customers on the uh, purchase cost. Uh, we could government could support uh, creating uh, a larger refueling network. In summary, moving from a petrol car to an electric, you have a price jump of almost three times as much. And the same holds true moving from an electric to a hydrogen, it's another three times. If you were to move from a petroleum car to a hydrogen, it's an eight times price jump almost. So with petrol, you can fill up just about anywhere in under five minutes. EVs are easier to recharge, but can take a minimum of 30 minutes, but usually measured more in hours for a full charge. And fuel cell electric vehicles have very few refueling options, but could be refueled in under five minutes if you find one. Without some government help, fuel cells just don't scream, buy me. So here's that chart I was talking about on uh, electric vehicle car sales around the planet. As you can see, the blue at the bottom there is China and it's growing quite rapidly. Uh, the gray on sort of to the top is Europe and they have good sales growth there. Uh, the USA, uh, kind of marginal really, um, middling. And actually it looks like we sort of dipped in our sales volumes along with China. Uh, Europe picked up the uh, slack in 2019. Uh, could attribute that to COVID, why not? <laughs> Everything else is. The interesting thing is China's increasing middle class is buying automobiles. China now buys 28% of the world's automobiles. The good news is that many are, have zero tailpipe emissions. I mean, you're looking in 2019, 2018 at over like a million and a a million, one, million, two cars, units. The bad news is that zero tailpipe emissions are going into the atmosphere via coal plants used to generate the electricity to charge them. So they're not getting the issues. So hydrogen vehicles can really only be offered in markets that provide hydrogen fueling stations. No stations, no growth. Companies like Shell, cheap plug, 
are adding on-site hydrogen production and adding hydrogen stations, predominantly in Germany and Norway, where they can use the excess um, renewable energy during the day to generate green hydrogen as a fuel, a vehicle fuel. On-site production does eliminate the need for transport, um, but it could add some storage requirements. Uh, De uh, Germany and Norway are kind of like IPP, where there's an abundance of excess renewable power and it's easier to implement a green hydrogen program. Now, uh, just so you know, I'm not biased. Chevron and Etawani are partnering to develop 30 hydrogen fueling stations in California by 2026. Um, they would be adding a hydrogen uh, refueling pump at Chevron stations around the state. And Itawani is a big, for those of you who aren't familiar, is a big Japanese uh, chemical company and they make hydrogen. Chevron makes hydrogen too at their refineries. Most refineries do have to make it. Um, so that's good. But despite 10 years of effort, hydrogen vehicles just are not able to gain market share in the US without significant incentives from their manufacturers as well as state and federal rebates. Almost all hydrogen vehicles sold in the US have been sold in California. Hey, guess what? That's because there are stations, um, uh, which has invested hundreds of millions of dollars to help create a hydrogen fueling infrastructure, but can all, still only count just a bit over 40 hydrogen fueling stations. And so here's what that looks like. You can see that most of them sit in uh, San Francisco or Los Angeles area. I guess that makes sense. That's probably where half the population resides. Um, True Zero is the prime developer of hydrogen stations in California. And that was a group of um, researchers, not unlike CHIPS, at the um, University of California, Irvine, that started uh, working on hydrogen cars years ago and said, hey, we could, here's a need. <laughs> Good for them. So they're all the guy in little green H's there. Uh, the other ones are either Shell, Air Liquide, Praxair, or Atawani. Chevron wouldn't be part of this yet. They'll be on this map eventually. So um, that's a uh, that's what 100 million, 125 million dollars would be. So it, it would sort of appear that due to the lack of hydrogen fueling options for cars, it tends to make hydrogen a better fuel for fleets and interstate trucking where centralized refueling sites um, will pencil out and they can produce hydrogen on site and, and be very cost efficient. And H hydrogen would be a perfect fit for public transportation um, such as municipal buses, US post office, and businesses, UPS, FedEx, that really can't afford vehicle downtime during the day due to long recharging times associated with batteries. So H hydrogen is better for fleet fueling at, right now as it can use on-site production. On-site production increases utilization of the refueling investment and eliminates transportation costs. It will necessitate some on-site storage, but you're probably gonna have to have some on-site storage regardless. The mix of this system generation can cause battery electrics to be less than 100% zero CO2. The greener the grid's resources, the higher the battery electric is to being 100% zero carbon. To extend the range of batteries, you, battery electric vehicles, you need to add more batteries, which add weight the, um, to the vehicle. Uh, and reduce some of the range gains. Hydrogen doesn't suffer as much from serious uh, range degradation as it's such a light element. Uh, and as previously discussed, the source of hydrogen, uh, blue or gray, can add hydrogen to the atmosphere. Uh, only green hydrogen is truly carbon free from source to wheel well. Electrolysis with Renewable energy needs to be expanded for processes developed that achieve essentially the same result, i.e. abundant hydrogen 
with no associated carbon released during the process. So here's a little chart. It's kind of interesting. Basically, this kind of uh, shows you by battery that as you, so you've got the lead battery on the left and it moves over to the nickel cadmium. And then right now the most advanced battery in play, the lithium ion, uh, that as you add uh, distance, you have to add batteries. And there are decreasing marginal returns on that weight. Batteries are heavy, they add weight to the vehicle and it offsets some of the increases. Um, note the battery, just note the battery evolution though for a minute. Uh, see how lead is not as good as nickel cadmium is not as good as lithium ion. So it's a great example again of the uh, technology curve. Um, the hydrogen, as you can see, you get a lot of bang for your buck as you add more hydrogen, you get more distance. That's one of the reasons the weight to range ratio is one reason that hydrogen might be a good aviation fuel where weight is everything to profitability. Um, so Toyota, one thing to keep an eye out on in, in battery development is the solid state battery. Uh, Toyota, Nissan, and Volkswagen are planning on deploying solid state battery electric vehicles in 2025, 2028, and 2025 respectively. Toyota has partnered with Subaru in this process. Toyota's partner in uh, solid state battery design and production is Panasonic. Uh, Toyota in a press release claims that their SSB will fully charge from flat in 10 minutes and will have a 500 kilometer range. Those are both very solid numbers for batteries. Um, solid state batteries have several times the energy density, which helps drastically reduce fueling times, putting the EV for the first time in the range of an ICE vehicle, refueling with gasoline. It remains to be seen, though, if Toyota will meet its 2025 deployment, um, as solid state batteries in the past have not performed well in cold temperatures and their long term durability has been questioned. Toyota hasn't discussed either of these issues, but some initial reports are looking like the problem of short lifespans with solid state batteries are plaguing the project. Panasonic is looking to rework components of the battery to hopefully eliminate those problems. The development uh, and manufacture of the SSB electric vehicle was helped along by the Japanese government providing $19.2 billion to support companies doing research in this field. Great examples of public-private partnerships. These batteries still have lithium, but a recent discovery of 6 million tons of lithium at the Salton Sea in California should enable continued battery production into the future. Even lithium only batteries have five to 7% lithium in them. The remaining materials are nickel, copper, and plastics. Let's look at the pluses and minuses of fuel cell vehicles that use hydrogen. So pluses, they are comparable to cars that run on regular gas in terms of acceleration and performance. They are quick fuel, uh, roughly three to five minutes. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to get that one. Three to five minutes uh, to fill your tank. They're capable of a driving range of up to 700 kilometers, 435 miles without refueling. Uh, they are more expensive though to purchase initially and fuel is more expensive. Refueling stations have low throughput and it is difficult to recover their fixed costs. Uh, part of the program California has is reimbursing the 44 stations that have been approved in that program for idle time, so to speak, and carrying inventory that's not being sold. Additionally, a common complaint among owners of the fuel cells is that stations, which are generally 100% automated, are often out of service and or out of fuel. Unlike electric vehicles, right now, if you own a fuel cell vehicle, you're pretty much tethered to California. It's possible to drive across the US or the EU in a battery electric. You'll end up uh, by the side of the road in a desert in Arizona or Nevada if you try that in a fuel cell vehicle right now. Um, 
as mentioned, the you know the fuel cell vehicle uh, refueling network is still small and retarding uh, customer acceptance. The uh, 44 fuel cells or 44 refueling stations in California represent 80% of all stations in the U.S. There are 200 stations spread across Europe and seven in Canada. In the remainder of the U.S., there are two in the Northeast and two in South Carolina. I don't know what's going on in South Carolina, but hey, they must like uh, fuel cells down there. Toyota is presently working to develop more stations in the Northeast to help improve the sales of their Mirai. You can actually log into Tesla's website and plan a trip anywhere in the US from to, and you put your model Tesla car in and it'll map your route for you through the most efficient path such that you can charge your vehicle and get from any point to another without running out of a charge. It will try to utilize hotels that have charging stations such that you can spend the night if you want to, or it will also try to utilize charging stations at or near restaurants to allow an hour while you eat. Okay, long haul trucks, a great fit. So if light duty vehicles are not going to be big users of hydrogen potentially due to the network, uh, refueling network not being built out, long haul trucks are a great fit because, um, now here's the, this is the Hyundai uh, offering. It's planned for pr uh, production in 2030. Uh, it, it's 600 to 800 mile range. That's kind of low. A current diesel with a 300 gallon tank will do 2,000 miles. But again, it's easy to change the range on hydrogen without any major impacts. In all, in all instances, this one pretty much meets the current um, trucking requirements. It's a 40 foot long trailer. It has a 41 foot turning radius. I like commercial freight because I think it's a great way to build out a hydrogen highway network that can support itself commercially and act as a network for light duty vehicles, cars, SUVs. It also gives you an opportunity for on-site uh, electrolyzers and storage of hydrogen and no transportation of hydrogen is required. Can use uh, and can use over production of renewable power in some areas. Now, Hyundai is not the only one it's getting into the trucking business here with fuel cells. Uh, Daimler Freightliner, uh, the largest seller of trucks in Europe and the United States, has a partnership with Bell to build a, with, <laughs> with Shell, to build a hydrogen corridor in Europe and compete on cost with diesel by 2027. This truck has a 600 mile range. Again, that's a little light, but I think that's easy to overcome. Uh, it's, they are also working on a smaller delivery trucks that are battery electrics in partnership with a company called Cattle, C-A-T-L, which is a Chinese battery company. They're actually the world's largest battery company. And they're building a battery plant in Germany, presumably as part of this partnership. Um, and Siemens to develop charming, charging stations. They wanna compete on cost with diesel with this unit by 2025. Volvo White has entered into a joint venture with Daimler to develop fuel cell systems for long distance trucks. And Toyota is testing semi trucks at the ports of LA and Long Beach. They have plans to build fuel cells for semi trucks in their Kentucky plant. And Toyota semi will have a 300 mile range, again, a little light there, but carry, 80,000 pounds, which is generally the standard weight that a 40 foot um, tractor trailer would pull. So battery electric vehicles um, are comparable with cars that run on regular gas in terms of general performance, but do accelerate much faster. Uh, they enjoy broader support from governments in terms of deploying funds to create public charging stations, which reduce range anxiety among consumers and help to improve sales. Uh, China and the EU are pushing forward with battery electrics, and President Biden's last infrastructure bill contains significant funding for installing more battery electric vehicle chargers. 
Accepting big rigs, fuel cell electric vehicle manufacturers have stagnated. No OEM, original equipment manufacturer, auto manufacturer, has announced a new uh, fuel cell electric vehicle offering. Almost all OEMs are offering battery electric vehicles across their fleets. Battery electrics take more time to refuel than hydrogen. However, if uh, battery uh, time can get to somewhere around 10 minutes or less, then fuel cells as a car could be done. It's really battery electrics last this advantage. It's honestly doubtful that fuel cells will overcome battery electrics as they're just too well established and there's no immediate positive feeling for fuel cells among consumers. You say electric vehicle and everyone thinks of one of the slick Tesla models. You say hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicle and they think of the Hindenburg. The industry needs to create more product interest in markets where they compete by running ads that introduce the public to the product and its benefits and safety. There are currently, there's currently research going on at Purdue, which is being funded by Ford, which aims to reduce battery electric vehicle charging times to be equivalent to a traditional gasoline fueling time, targeting five minutes. Again, technology curve, always got to keep an eye on it. Um, okay, so let's skip over there. The next area, though, that's just going to be absolutely critical for hydrogen is uh, policy support. So a consistent message of hydrogen benefits needs to be developed. Blanket statements of, you know, 100% carbon free power by 2035 need to be monitored and supported to happen. Have FERC monitor and agree timelines with generators. Uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission should be involved too to support the growth of new generation nuclear generators or upgrading and improving power and gas grids. Uh, plan which areas to work on first. Prioritize areas that produce the largest and quickest results. Remember, three years, tick, 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 tick. Changes in the regulatory compact with gas and power utilities to assist in the move to zero, a zero carbon economy with as little disruption to companies and employees as possible. Same approach is needed with oil and gas production. We need a strong public-private partnership to make sure that there are no more, oh, this will create plenty of new green jobs to replace those being lost in the big one, power plant, coal mine, auto company, refinery, gas operation system, and then no plan to make that happen. And many workers are just turfed out on the streets. Um, we need to pave the way for financing, creative financing, uh, avenues to provide funding to create new technologies and or make technology changes to existing ones that are needed. This doesn't all need to be government financing, could be government backed loans. That helps manage the deficit sort of issue that you hear a lot of people talk about. Hydrogen must be 100% green and its cost to produce must come down. Government needs to supply research funding to advance the new methods to produce green hydrogen, like the German approach. Uh, government must play a larger role in greenhouse gas uh, reductions with financing, like Japan, and planning, like New Zealand. It is a must to grow the number of hydrogen fueling stations in support to support the growth with public money, just like being is being done with battery electrics. Oh, wait a minute, you say. Americans aren't going to want to pay for all that. Oh, don't be so sure. This is the results from a recent Gallup poll uh, taken that was asking Americans, would they support econ environment over economy or the other way around when it comes to government spending? 53% of respondents said that protecting the environment has a greater priority and 42% said economic growth. There was a divergence amongst uh, the uh, parties Republicans were more concerned about the risk of harm to the economy and expansion of the deficit from passing a bunch of climate change laws, whereas 75% of the Democrats believe the risk to the environment outweighs the risk to the economy and the budget deficit. Of the six uh, proposals that were put in front of people to poll, the Democrats favored all of them. 
Republicans do favor some of them though, which are generally along the lines of tax credits for people who install clean energy systems, tax incentives for business that use alternative energy and higher efficiency standards for vehicles, fuel efficiency standards for vehicles. They tended to oppose methane emission limits and promoting electric vehicle use. So Keeps uh, has uh, Keeps goals will support hydrogen carbon uh, hydrogen in a carbon transition. Policy change is critical. So the underlying items are taken directly from the website for Cheaps. Um, the first one being create green hydrogen using catalytic technologies without creating CO2. Great. The second one. Um, one things I one of the things I actually like about organizations like Jeeps is that they're on the cutting edge of change and can help bend change in reasonable ways that lead to good long-term outcomes. Chips has a great interdisciplinary talent mix and being in within a research university can draw in any additionally required talent from different disciplines to help progress policy change where it's needed. Government, government policy, legal, marketing. The second uh, item here of storing hydrogen in geologic formations where gas and oil previously resided or in another chemical compound form. Great, absolutely necessary. Um, storing allows for the creation of forward markets via the creation of paper financial derivatives, which will allow for forward decisions by hedging, which can drive more long-term investment decision through price certainty. Think of West Texas Intermediate Crude at Cushing, Oklahoma. Given Oklahoma's proximity to pipelines, ship the hydrogen to market and repurposed pipelines. This is an important step presently, given that H hydrogen uh, being such a small molecule will generally pass through traditional storage tanks and pipelines will become brittle and fail. Large hydrogen production in the center of the U.S. can fan out to all major regions, the West, the Midwest, well, you know all the regions. Uh, research directed by CHIPS can solve the transportation issues. Uh, create a hydrogen highway system. So the increased supply will support the ability to add new refueling locations across the country. I would suggest that the initial focus be on locations along major interstate highways used by freight companies to ensure that stations have a high utilization rate to spread fixed costs. It's sort of the hydrogen highway concept that was introduced by Governor Schwarzenegger in California years ago. Only all the fueling stations seem to have gotten stuck in Los Angeles and San Francisco. Uh, the price of placing hydrogen fueling uh, infrastructure about every 300 to 500 miles apart. If supply of H2 hydrogen uh, and price of hydrogen are not addressed, then hydrogen will not be a viable solution for transportation beyond trucks, fleets, buses, and trains. Uh, battery electric vehicles will win the auto transportation race, which, you know, is it a win? Is it a tie? Uh, it could be that hy the hydrogen highway creates a, is a series of electrolyzers that produce and store on-site hydrogen for trucks and cars. So I was suggesting that CHIPS creates a policy group also. Um, and its mission would be to lobby government in support of hydrogen based on the types of uh, actions or activities that it feels needs to be taken to move hydrogen forward and open up the economy. Uh, it would, the government, then would direct OEMs or whomever uh, to add models, this one example in automobiles, which would cause oil majors to have to refine and support and distribute hydrogen, thus driving hydrogen growth. And visually, that looks like this on this screen here. Okay, we're getting to the end here, folks. Drum roll, no. Um, so to summarize, yes, hydrogen can help save the world, but it will be one step of a journey of many steps. 
Hydrogen cannot solve all the greenhouse gas problems, but it can play a significant role in transportation, fleets, interstate transport, buses, cars, trains, ships, maybe airplanes, creating a hydrogen highway in support of interstate transport across the country, fuel for off-grid power generation at small commercial and residential locations via fuel cells, and supplying new hydrogen designed generators with 30, 70 fuel mix and later 100% hydrogen. There are some problems to solve though. Like Japan, the US needs an overarching energy policy that lays out how country will move from where it is to where it needs to go and who is responsible. Policies need to be monitored and enforced. Uh, we need to reduce the cost. Hydrogen is presently too expensive. Delivery, uh, current uh, transmission and distribution networks will only be able to carry a limited amount of hydrogen. Hydrogen is so small, it makes steel brittle and subject to failure. More research is needed in this area, which I think chips could uh, and solve. And we need to solve the sunk cost problem of industries that are no longer needed in a zero carbon economy. Um, natural gas power and transmission and distribution companies and oil gas producers and refiners, there are millions trillions of dollars of investment in transportation, distribution, storage in the, in the US all centered on a business model that produces, sells, produces and sells natural gas, electricity and gasoline. Those companies and their millions of employees will need to transform. A plan on how to support other energy sources that can complement hydrogen, new nuclear technology, hydro, solid state batteries, methane prolysis, and drive the US to zero carbon may shed light on this solution. I would suggest that um, these companies could still exist, that they would just look different. And you know, instead of refining uh, oil, maybe they would be uh, processing uh, water and turning it into hydrogen. Uh, the t and companies, instead of delivering uh, natural gas would be delivering hydrogen. So they might not be as big and they might be a little different and there might be new ones, but I think you just, you do in a major um, change of the environment need to make sure you think about how everyone is. Thank you for your time today. Um, do we have any questions? Um I think what we'll do is uh, I, I'll funnel questions, and we do have one off the bat. Um, and I'm I'm also mindful of people's time. I, I think we've got probably ten minutes for um, uh, for Q and A. Uh, so someone asks, I'm new to hydrogen uh, and have a question about safety issues as compared to natural gas and compared to oil products for fueling cars. Okay, and that is one of the questions that comes up a lot. Um, I will. I would just say that uh, the hydrogen tanks that have been developed for automobiles, for the fuel cell electrics, uh, have been rigorously tested. They've dropped. Uh, they've dropped. Uh, you know, a ton on them, and you know, you might crush the tank, but it doesn't explode. Uh, they've shot them with high caliber weapons and they don't explode. Um, the, uh, the gasoline is probably, um, gasoline and natural gas are probably, uh, you know, in that same sort of category. I mean, you can have a, uh, you can have explosions, fires, et cetera. Um, there are uh, there are uh, always potential health issues associated with um, any of those types of products. Um, probably less so with hydrogen, I would think, because it's such a light 
material, if it gets out, it's just going to go straight up. I don't know if that covers the question. I'll, I'll invite the, the person who asked the question to put a, a, a response in uh, Q&A if, um, if they still have one. Um, uh, and uh, I'll ask uh, other, uh, other folks on the call to um, go ahead and, and put a question in, um, uh, in Q&A. Um, in the meantime, oh, here we go. We're gonna uh, get a big review of everybody. In the meantime, I'll ask a question, which I think is maybe a little bit off of, um, uh, it's not directly a hydrogen question, but uh, uh, is about the idea that the grid requires some baseline supply. And that's what makes um, uh, natural gas, even coal, and also nuclear um, still you know, part of the equation. I just happened to see an item on the news about geothermal and uh -huh. wonder if you've, you've got any, uh, ideas about the you know practicality can that scale up and provide the kind of input into the grid that's required to keep things going yeah they're pretty successful with geothermal down in um, New Zealand uh, a great deal of their electrical grid is supplied with uh, the geothermal energy and there's nothing really special about it it's just that it's hot water and that's all these other things are doing is taking water and heating it making steam and then spinning a turbine with it um, so yeah, no, that, that works. The, some of the geothermal wells, California had started to sort of plug up over time and they had to be, uh, re-drilled to keep them clean and open and keep the, uh, sludge <laughs> coming up the pipe. But no, yeah, geothermal works great. I, I don't know if you recall that one shot I had, uh, the intermountain power plant. There's a lot of geothermal up in northern Nevada that I guess gets funneled into that area. So I can't recall the location of the plant that the news story I it was just on the PBS News Hour not too long ago, and I just yeah, happened yeah. to uh, to see it. So um, the person who asked about safety has uh, got a follow up here. So yes. uh, that person says thanks for the answer. I also meant in terms of risk associated with it, it makes me think of hydrogen bombs with a smiley emoji. Um, like is the risk of a small hydrogen leak the same as the risk of a natural gas leak or does it require greater security and standards because of higher risks? So are there particular risks associated? And I would, let me add to that, both at the yeah. kind of small scale level of the, say, the individual vehicle, but in the production um, process as well. All fuels are Risky, period. Um, if you've, I don't know if anyone's ever had an opportunity to tour a very large uh, oil refinery, but that is just a great big bomb waiting to go off. And, you know, through safety processes, automated um, shutdown processes, et cetera, uh, it, you know, you contain that and reduce that risk. Uh, same thing happens at a natural gas processing plant. Um, and hydrogen is actually produced in a lot of the, right now, because it's steam methane re forming, uh, in uh, large uh, oil refineries. Um, they're, to me personally, they're all equally dangerous. Uh, you know, if you have a hydrogen leak, and it it has to have a an igni igniter source, but same with gas and crude and any of those things. One thing that's I think most people would find interesting is you know if you have a, a leak on a big interstate pipeline, so you know you've got these thirty six inch pipelines that move natural gas from you know Texas to California, and if you bust one of those open, the gas has to be about, you know, a hundred plus feet in the air before it's got enough oxygen mixed in with it that it'll actually ignite. If you put a fire to it right at the source of the leak, it would put the fire out. It's under such high pressure. 
I can ask a question. Uh, you mentioned that the, the cost and the pros, the cons, the pros and cons between uh, battery uh, vehicles and the fuel cells. But um, is there any effort by anybody in the automobile industry to look at uh, burning hydrogen instead of using it as a fuel cell, just use combustion engines, but burning hydrogen instead of burning, uh, you know, the current, the, the gasoline or the, the diesel that we burn now? Is that a Yeah, there is. Or? There is. And there's also a lot of work going on around ammonia. Um, apparently, ammonia would require very little um, alteration of a present internal combustion engine. Um, I don't know if there are any other nasty things that come with ammonia when it comes out the tailpipe after it's been burned, but uh, yeah, there. That probably has... NOX no is probably like it, yeah. ammonia has an <laughs> N8 uh, in, the, yeah. in the atomic um, formula. Yeah, so yeah. That, that might be something. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, cars, uh, you know, I'm imagining, I don't know, but I'm imagining cars throw out some NOX right now, you know? I mean, it depends on the fuel. Yeah. I think this question uh, from our audience might might be related, maybe. Uh, and someone asks, in order to make hydrogen-based vehicles an alternative for carbon-based vehicles, we need to make them affordable for low-income countries. However, low-income uh, countries have other issues like poverty, and they cannot afford hydrogen-based vehicles. What's your perspective on all this? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's always a, a, a tough one. You know, I mean. The lower income countries, you know, they're probably just concerned about, hey, can we get electricity for our people, clean water, that kind of stuff, and don't even really have much of an infrastructure to support uh, internal combustion engine, gasoline driven vehicles. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, I think the, uh, or the question is absolutely right. I think that you can't forget any part of the uh, market, if you will, in that you want a lot of uptake. Now, sometimes, the, you know, just economics drive that in a certain direction. Um, I know it, when I was at Shell, we were always trying to figure out a way to take uh, liquefied natural gas down into a lot of the um, Caribbean islands because they were burning fuel oil, which is very dirty. And look, LNG would be a very clean source to run power plants with. And, it, you know, it was tough. You could say, well, first you have to build a smaller ship or <laughs> find or put some offshore lightering in. Um, but, you know, but, you know, they would have benefited greatly from, from that. It's, uh, you know. Um, to follow up on that, and then we've got one more uh, question from the floor. Um, I know, I, I don't know the, the terminology uh, for this beyond the idea of leapfrogging. So sometimes underdeveloped uh, countries can leapfrog an intermediate yes. stage of technology in order to get to, so the cell phone case is the one that I'm most familiar mm -hmm. with. Are yep. there opportunities for leapfrogging sort of legacy energy uh, systems with, with the high, in, in, you know, going straight into the hydrogen world or is, mm -hmm. that, is that not available really? No, I think it is. Uh, you know, that was one of my points about China is that, you know, they are, um, they started off with uh, internal combustion engine cars in their marketplace, but they're just, a lot of them are just moving to Teslas, you know, because they can. And it's, you know, there's no reason to go through that whole process of, oh, let's figure out better. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. I, the other thing I think is an area of leapfrogging is, mentioned the hydrogen fuel cells for residences and small businesses. Uh, I think that's great because that would mean you don't have to put in transmission, distribution lines, big generators, transformers, you know, you could just cut that whole thing out of the middle there. Um, we've got uh, an additional question and I, I think probably we should make this the last question. Um, okay because uh, our time is, is done. Um, what would all this mean for disposal or waste produced uh, of hydrogen fuel cells? Uh, that is to say, what's going to be the environmental impact of the production of the technology itself? Well, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that the, um, I think Toyota has started to look at that because they're one of the biggest producers of fuel cells. 
and that's part of their um, they're a big piece of the Japanese uh, economy being hydrogen based. And they're starting to look at, okay, well, there are a lot of metals and things that you can, you know, you can recycle a lot of it, quite frankly, um, uh, economically. There are a lot of very precious, expensive metals in there. And there are some things that really kind of like uh, your LED lights now, you know, they have some mercury in them. So they have to go, they can't just go in the trash can. They have to go off to, you know, your special light bulb recycler. Uh, so I think that's kind of where it would end up. But that's a great question because that was the question on the on the batteries too. You know, initially I was like, "Well, you know, like damn batteries." You know? Right. As a Prius owner, I I am uh, mindful of of that question in particular. Mm -hmm. Well, let me uh, speak for everybody out in Zoomland and and uh, offer Hank our our deep thanks for this really illuminating talk. And I I myself appreciated. Um, the way you you brought the sort of wider world uh, to bear on what we're trying to do with CHEPS and showed us some of the ways that CHEPS might reach out to the to the wider world. So thank you um, very much for your uh, for your You're presentation. Welcome. I and, appreciate the time. And um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to stop recording and and I'll say uh, goodbye to the uh, to the folks who have uh, joined us. Uh, thanks so much for attending.